All righty. Good afternoon and welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm David Gray, and on behalf of my colleague Lisa Guernsey and all of us here at New America, we delve into the 2012 election this afternoon and welcome you to this event on what the presidential candidates should be saying about child care and early learning. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to all those who are watching over the Internet and watching it live on C-SPAN. I want to begin by saying thank you to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for its leadership on the issues we'll be discussing today and its support of this and other events. In our research here, we have come to believe that attention to and investments in quality, affordable child care and in early learning can have dual generational benefits that can make a difference for the social mobility of American families. You'll be hearing about some of those advantages this afternoon. Lisa and I have hosted a number of events previously on child care and early learning, but today we'll be talking about what the candidates and the parties should be discussing. Because next Wednesday night, the presidential debates begin. And thus far in our discussions with the Obama and Romney campaigns, and as we've looked at the party platforms, we've seen less attention paid to child care and early learning than we might have expected, both in the presidential and also in the congressional races. Given the research that points to the impact of attention to the earliest years of life, and given the advantages of child care and helping low-income workers, we might have expected, for example, Democrats to focus on child care after Obama had been criticized for allowing flexibility for states and welfare work requirements. And then given the gender gap that Republicans face and need to overcome, and given that child care has been an issue that many working mothers have been concerned about for a long time, we might have expected some attention to be paid by Republicans. As I've reported in a recent Huffington Post piece and others have talked about, there's been insufficient attention paid by the campaigns in the opinion of many. The singular focus on employment and the deficit have taken the wind out of the sails of issues such as these. And yet, they're critical and linked to jobs and social mobility both now and in the future. Now, meanwhile, there's been a lot of work going on in the U.S. Senate to develop a reauthorization bill on the Child Care and Development Block Grant, as many of you know. From what I understand, they're making good progress at the committee level and endeavor to present a draft to the public to view in the very near future. As I understand it, some of the keys for Senators Burr and Mikulski, for example, have been on raising the quality and health and safety in programs for kids, even given a resource-constrained environment. That could mean a more, more modest reauthorization, but still there are opportunities available for kids to be safer. But there will be, of course, a lot of opinions on this legislation when it comes out. And there'll be a lot of opinions expressed here today, both by our panelists and by you in the audience. Something's come up at the Senate, and Chris Toppings is likely pulled away for today, I'm afraid. But we have four experts that I'm thrilled to be, that are here today to help us think through what the candidates should be saying next month in the debates, and then what whoever wins in November should say when Congress comes back and then in 2013 about early learning and child care. Full biographies on all four speakers are available outside, along with some reading materials by us and some of our speakers. But we are very pleased to be joined by Helen Blank, who is the Director of Child Care and Early Learning at the National Women's Law Center. Rob Duggar, who is Chairman of the Ready Nation Advisory Board and Invest in Kids Working Group. Grace Reef, who's Chief of uh, Public Policy and Evaluation with Child Care Aware of America. And Lisa Guernsey, who's Director of the Early Education Initiative at the New America Foundation. Friends, thank you for taking your valuable time to be with us today. We'll begin with me posing questions, uh, some specific questions to each of our speakers that build on the general topic. And then after their responses and comments, we'll open the discussion up for your questions. So Grace, let's begin with you today, and just I'd like your perspective if you would start us off about what the candidates really should be most focusing on to create an ideal child care system. If you could pass the best CCDBG reauthorization bill in the world, what would you like? How should the system be changed to meet the needs of families and children? In other words, what are the most important changes to the system that you would make uh, if you were a presidential candidate? Well, I think that's more than one question. Well, actually. it is. That's right. <laughs> But, you know, let me just say, uh, it's amazing that the candidates can be so focused on jobs and not have talked about child care. I mean, uh, parents who have young children need child care to work. If they don't have child care, they can't work. So that really is an omission that is interesting at best, that they haven't yet talked about child care. Uh, here's what I wish 
uh, the candidates would talk about. First of all, that child care is key to working parents, that if we're going to strengthen this economy, we need to have affordable, quality child care. Second, children in child care need to be safe, and they need to be in a setting that promotes their healthy development. And, uh, you know, we're really not where we should be on that today. Uh, at Child Care Aware of America, we have done six licensing studies in the last couple of years. We've taken a look at state laws and regulations to see what the states are doing with regard to child care centers and family child care homes. And what we found is really not okay. Uh, the average score for centers in our reports is of 87, which is out of 150, so that's about 58%. So that would be a failing grade in any classroom in America for <laughs> family child care homes, you know, at home care. The average score is at 69, which is out of 150, which is a 46%, which is even worse. Um, we just came out with a report. I don't know if you've seen it. I brought some today. It's called Leaving Children to Chance. Uh, this report we came out with a couple months ago, and it looked at what's happening with family child care homes. Uh, you know, when you look at the top 10 scores, you had no A's. You had one B, four C's, four D's, and the 10th state, Massachusetts, failed, and they were in the top 10. So all the other states are really not where they should be. And you ask, well, not where they should be with what? Let's start with, um, I think I heard uh, the first remarks say, you know, investments in child care and early learning. I don't think it's child care and early learning. I think that for many parents and many children, child care is an early learning program. Uh, children uh, are there on average, 11 million kids. Uh, about 35 hours a week. And so, you know, for those lucky enough, uh, you know, 1.3 million ki children who are in state pre-K a couple hours a day, a couple hours a week, that's, that's great. And that makes a huge difference in school readiness. And for the almost a million, it's 967,000 children who are in Head Start. I think primarily four, that also makes a big difference. But the rest of the children, as I said, there's 11 million, they're in childcare somewhere. And those settings matter. And, uh, that's why, you know, when we look at our licensing system and we see uh, how it's stacking up, it's really important to ensure that those teachers, number one, are uh, safe. Uh, let's weed out the people who don't belong in the business of caring for unrelated children. So we want to see a comprehensive background check. Second, training, minimum training, is the biggest way you can improve the quality of care. You need education, you need training. And that is what guides effective interaction between children and adults. It's approaches to learning, it's safety, like basic CPR, uh, and health and safety practices, and, and uh, approaching children with maybe different behavioral issues. And all of that leads to school readiness. And uh, the fact is we can't be looking at children in kindergarten and then the later grades and see uh, that they're not really progressing the way that they should and ignore the fact that they spent five years in a child care setting where maybe the TV in, was on all day or maybe, you know, the, the providers didn't have any training and they didn't have age-appropriate uh, stimulation activities, thinking, uh, things that we'd like to see in a quality early learning <coughs> setting. So at a minimum, background checks, minimum training. Uh, we also want to see inspections. Why? Uh, because inspections help ensure that when a state does set standards, um, we all know the federal law doesn't have any minimum, so there's nothing really to check on. Uh, but when each state does have a policy of inspecting, that they look to see, you know, are the children safe and, you know, what's the caregiver doing? Um, that somebody's in there on a regular basis, at least once a year, preferably uh, more often. Uh, because otherwise, uh, any standards, even a gold standard, doesn't matter. You know, in California, they do inspections once every five years. In Montana, it's once every five years. In uh, Pennsylvania, it's once every six. In uh, Michigan, it's once every ten. The law calls for effective enforcement, but if anybody thinks every, you know, once every five years or six or ten is effective, I, uh, I think, expect uh, a little more than that. Um, so we are looking, basically, to raise the bar. And uh, we spend a lot of time working with parents. Parents make assumptions. We've done polling. Parents assume a license means something. Um, they assume there are some basic protections for children. Uh, they assume that somebody's looking out to see where are, you know, how's the program doing. But what we know from um, the gap between the logical assumptions of parents and what's actually happening in state policies is that 
it's huge. Uh, the parents that we've been working with throughout the country have stories to tell. And uh, I'm hoping that it would make the candidates uh, think twice. What are we doing? I was in Alaska two weeks ago. A 19-month-old toddler died on the playground. Uh, she had a, uh, she was strangled on some playground equipment. And when the grandmother came to pick her up, the quote in the newspaper was, oh, all the staff were running around to find somebody who knew CPR. And, you know, I'm thinking, they had to rush around to find someone who knew CPR? Why isn't it a requirement that every, you know, staff person who's working with children in a child care center is required to know CPR? I mean, a crisis happens and they have to rush around to find somebody? And I'll tell you, it's because, you know, the state laws require uh, somebody on the premises have CPR. Okay, so you rush around and find that somebody when a bad thing happens? You know what? That's not okay. Would it have made a difference for that child? I don't really know. But I know that we have examples from our parents who've had some really tragic things happen that the status quo is not okay. And until we talk about what's really going on out there, it's hard to get policymakers' attention to see the status quo is not okay. We really need to fix it. We really need to do something about it. So I think we're really hoping that this reauthorization bill, in a bipartisan manner, with limited you know, fiscal options, we all know that. Uh, I wish we had a printing press and a magic wand, but unfortunately we don't, um, is a roadmap to quality. And it starts with safety. That is the bottom rung. No child should be in a child care setting, regardless of income. I, I haven't even started talking about you know, children on a subsidy and what they have access to. But let's say all children, regardless of income, should be safe in child care. And parents shouldn't have anxiety when they're at work about whether or not their child's going to be safe. And these parents have learned the hard way through a tragic situation. Uh, uh, hopefully, we can do something to preempt that from ever happening. Um, so I will say, uh, I'm not exactly sure what else you're looking for in a federal bill, but one is safety. Two is maybe if we uh, require some minimum training and um, start on that road to quality, we can do things that make a difference, like technical assistance to follow up training to make sure that somebody who gets some training actually uh, uses that training effectively, either in a home setting or in a child care center. Uh, we're not quite there yet. A lot of our agencies, we have 600 agencies throughout the country. They train about 600,000 providers a year. They also uh, work with a lot of providers on technical assistance to make sure that the training sticks and makes a difference. Uh, but I think we need more of it. Um, and so we're looking to try and see if the cornerstone of quality in a child care setting is the training and education of the workforce, if we can up the bar on that. Um, I think uh, there's a lot that can be done. I think that um, as far as quality is concerned, you have about 28 states with a quality rating system. That's a really good thing. Transparency for parents so that they can better understand the settings that they're selecting. It's tough to be a parent. You know, what questions do you ask? What do you look for? I think every parent wants the warm person who's going to be friendly and and nice and you can click with because you want someone who's going to love your children. But at the same time, the expectation should be, if you're in the business of caring for unrelated children, there should be some criteria that come with that too. You should not have a history of violent offenses so that you might be a potential harm to the child. You should have some minimum training so that um, what you're doing can nurture the children. Um, and hopefully put them in a situation better ready to succeed when they start school. Unfortunately, as I said, what we've seen from our studies is that's not happening. Um, I want to end with one other thing, which is we also have done a report on affordability, and it's called Parents and the High Cost of Child Care. And the fact of the matter is, I've just described, we're really not where we should be on the quality of care and safety of care. And for where we are, it's not affordable. It's crazy. You know, how can it be that there's so much improvement to be done, really, to be where we need to go on this roadmap, and parents are, you know, tapped out? It's not affordable. In 36 states, the cost of infant care in a center is more than uh, college. How can that be? Um, that is the reality, and I think we're going to have to look at some point 
alternative ways to finance childcare and early education because parents are tapped out. The condition and quality of what's out there is really not what it should be to protect and promote the healthy development of children. And uh, how are we going to deal with that? This is not a low-income children's issue. This is not a poverty issue. It is to some extent. But this, really, the cost of care is a problem for all families, regardless of income. And frankly, I have three children. But if you have more than one child, it's almost impossible. So you want to license the access, you want to access the license market, you want the license market to mean something. You don't want children just to be safe. That should be the minimum. Do no harm. Children, you know, children in childcare, there should be no harm. And then it should be a roadmap to quality so that there's some type of connection between the setting you're in before you reach school and the point that you enter school so that you can succeed. So I think that is our vision of what we'd like to see in any reauthorization bill. Grace, that's very helpful. I know we'll have a chance to go deeper in Q&A as well. Yeah, I got, I've got four kids under six, and I'm um, struggling with every question you just raised, so I appreciate you raising it. Now, Helen, give me some good news here. Let's, let's say uh, uh, you're going to plan the system, and it's going to be uh, your opportunity to, to, to work on reauthorization. Um, uh, and what would you put into the, to, the, uh, to the bill? And then I'll maybe I'll hold my second question until you finish that one rather than well, I've got another I'm going to put them you. together. Put, then, I'll, then I'll ask Go my ahead. second question because she knows a uh, sense of what I'm going to ask. I'm very interested in the in the in in today versus the the, the uh, 1988 to 1990 time period and 1996 time periods versus today. And and along with Grace Helen, uh, one of the leaders uh, when we had the Child Care Development Block Grant as it as it was uh, came about in, in 1990, following a campaign in 1988 where Bush. 41 and Dukakis talked about child care in the 88 campaign in a way that we haven't seen uh, since, I would argue, uh, but in many ways led to what happened in 1990 with CCDBG. Then in 1996, you had a campaign that was also uh, what it was, and, and, and the environment led to uh, some uh, reauthorization or some, some uh, updates in the law in 1996, and then child tax credit. So, so things were different. Presidential candidates always I didn't always um, ignore some of these issues. There have been some relatively recent examples of, of uh, where conditions were a little bit different. I'm curious as, as to what, uh, am I right? Am I reading some of the historical uh, tea leaves in terms of the elections? And what do we need to do now to, to return to some of the conditions where there's more attention to the issues uh, in this campaign, uh, similar to the way we, we saw in, in 88 and, and 96? So sorry, put the, put the two questions. Was that the second question you thought I was going to ask you? Yeah. Good. Right. Good. <laughs> And I'm going to um, also try to present to a, a fuller picture of sort of, of where we are and what parents and providers are facing. And I, I, David, I really appreciate to, the opportunity to be here today on behalf of the National Women's Law Center. Somehow in my very long career, I have always heard that it's not the right time for children and we don't have enough money to do what's right. When we were working on CCDBG, which was then called the Act for Better Child Care, someone took me to lunch and said, how dare you ask for $2 billion at the time when we have such a big deficit? Um, and I don't think that the lack of resources should be the starting point for our debate on CCDBG reauthorization. Let's be clear, for low-income children to be in high-quality early childhood settings that will improve their chances for better life outcomes, there have to be increased investments to support children, parents, early childhood educators, and child care programs. And that's not impossible, even in this environment, especially given the strong case for investing in early childhood. Child care assistance, it's a twofer. It can help improve a child's child care environment, especially if it's robust enough to support high quality care. Child care assistance by, relief, by helping families work and go to school can also lead to positive effects on a child's home environment. Both of these environments, both outside the child's home and the environment inside the child's home, can have a significant impact on children's development and pay off for our country, both for this economy and for our future economy. Despite the expanding awareness about the importance of better quality experiences for young children, and you'll hear that, I'm sure, from our other panelists, and the importance of childcare assistance for parents to work, 
we still haven't found the will to ensure that all of our children and their families, especially the most vulnerable, have the early childhood opportunities they need. And we owe our young children and our families who are trying desperately to work, we owe them better, and we need to do this for the sake of our nation's economic success. Early childhood doesn't have an extensive financing stream undergirding it like K-12 education. As Grace talked about, the bulk of support comes from parents. And we can't build a high quality system with safe and supportive environments with parents picking up the majority of the costs because you've seen they're stretching themselves as far as they can. We can learn much from past reauthorizations. I think history teaches us a lot. Um, regarding the relationship of child care assistance to work, the challenges of winning the supports necessary to support high quality care, and the recognition that new investments are integral to successful reauthorizations. There were actually three reauthorizations that are relevant. Discussions around the 1990 reauthorization began in the spring of 1986 because we recognized it could be a pre presidential campaign issue. In the midst of planning the child care campaign that resulted in CCDBG, we took time out, and I remember being in the back of our conference room around these discussions, to work with Congress and the Reagan administration in a complimentary opportunity presented by a debate on welfare. They all agreed that child care assistance was key to enabling low-income mothers to get and keep a job. This led to an entitlement for child care assistance for mothers receiving welfare and a year of transitional child care assistance as mothers moved off. It wasn't even a fight. The debate also included a realization and a guarantee that programs receiving child care subsidies should at minimum receive the market rate for their services. Then we moved to the discussions around CCDBG. The child care entitlement for a substantial group of low income, our most vulnerable mothers, was in place. We were then able to focus on making sure low-income mothers not on welfare. And this is really the same group of mothers because women move on and off welfare. They need a child care assistance as well. There was also, as now, a strong discussion around improving the quality and building the supply of child care. The bipartisan bills that were introduced in both houses with a significant number of co-sponsors included federal standards because in the end, the standards that govern the, govern the funding and the accompanying resources to meet them are the key drivers of quality. However, then as always, there were competing voices and policy tensions between helping moms work, helping children succeed, the federal role, and state flexibility. The states weighed in. They joined the first Bush administration to argue for flexibility. As a result, in order to move forward and enact legislation, the quality set aside, which with a supply set aside had been over 20% of total funding, was significantly cut back. The federal standards were eliminated early in the process. A compromise on standards was further weakened in the final negotiations with the Bush administration, resulting in a provision the states only had to set minimal health and safety standards. Congress was clear from early debates that certain relatives receiving funds should be exempt from these standards. Funding was also cut back. <coughs> the bill was finally enacted after a three-year debate, and we were happy. It was, interestingly enough, included in a deficit reduction bill that also increased benefits from the earned income tax credit and raised taxes. It represented significant compromises, but was enthusiastically re received by the states, putting them on a stronger path. As Phil Accord, a child could care director in Tennessee testified this summer at a child care hearing, it made a big difference for our parents and our providers. Let's turn to 1996. Then the debate was very basic. Congress decided to end the child care entitlement. At the same time, this was a little ironic, as they were ending welfare as we know it and time limiting welfare benefits. However, this time advocates joined by governors, Congress, and the Clinton administration, agreed that a significant infusion of new child care funds were necessary if low-income women were going to face increased work requirements. This led to a second version of a Senate bill that included a $4 billion increase in child care funds over five years. The TANF bill also included provi a provision that allowed some TANF funding to be transferred to CCDBG. It was absolutely clear in that debate that if most of the low-income women being expected to work were not going to earn enough to pay for childcare. This is still true. 
The battle over quality was illuminating. The governors leading the welfare discussions and many Republicans in the House wanted to completely eliminate the minimum standards and the quality set aside. After a long fight, we won bipartisan support to maintain both, but we lost the requirement that states pay for the market rate. There was no meaningful discussion of improvements over, that two, over those two years. With these new funds and additional funding later in the Clinton administration, states made improvements between 1996 and 2001. They raised wages for providers. Some actually guaranteed childcare assistance to low-income mothers, whether they were on welfare or not. They helped childcare teachers go back to school. Some hired new licensing inspectors. Then funds began to stagnate. Only one out of six children eligible for federal child care assistance now receives it. The number of children receiving help is actually declining. It's likely by the end of the year we'll be reaching only about one and a half million children. This is the lowest number of children served since 1998. However, the need for help is not dropping. Yet, but the cupboard for children who need high quality care while their parents struggle to work is bare. According to a study that the National Women's Law Center did in 2011, families in 37 states were worse off under one or more child care assistance policies than they were in 2010. States are making Solomon-like choices. Do they serve fewer children? Do they ask parents to contribute more to the, toward the cost of the care? Do they pay child care providers lower rates? Waiting lists continue to grow. 75,000 children in Florida. When we did the child care bill, there were 25,000, over 20,000 children in Maryland and 36,000 in Massachusetts. At the same time, there's a fraying safety net for these families. The number of mothers receiving TANF is declining with time limits. More children are living not only in poverty, but in deep poverty. It's challenging for child care providers serving low-income children to provide high-quality care with reimbursement rates that have failed to keep keep pace with rising costs. Only three states pay providers at the federally recommended level, compared to 22 states in 2001. Well, three-fifths of the states report that they pay higher rates for high-quality care at approximately four-fifths of these states. The reimbursement rates, even at the highest quality level, is below the 75th percentile of current market rates. Quality rating systems are an interesting way to help parents understand about higher quality care. But they are not real if parents don't have money to access this higher quality care and if providers don't get the support they need to improve the, their settings. Families receiving child care assistance now, because of low rates, may have difficulty finding a high quality or any child care option in their neighborhoods. Child care centers and family child care homes are shutting their doors in low income communities, and more providers in middle income communities find it all but impossible to serve families receiving child care assistance. I'd urge presidential candidates to listen to the moms and to the providers. In New York City, three quarters of the families on a waiting list reported that their child care arrangements were negatively affecting their children. One parent from Minnesota is on the waiting list. My child is six months old and has been in three horrible daycares in two and a half months. Research is clear that parents are more likely to work if they have reliable child care. And they find it very, very challenging to work when they do not. In North Carolina, about one out of four families on their state's waiting list had lost or had to quit their jobs while waiting for child care assistance. A Minnesota parent without assistance explained the consequences. I lost that job after eight months because of upsets in my schedule due to babysitting problems. I was very conscientious about lining up child care arrangements, but disruptions caused everything that I had carefully planned to come tumbling down. Low-income moms live on the edge. They face so many challenges, and child care assistance is a lifeline. There are countless other stories about moms who benefited from child care assistance, but time is short. There's no way that we can reach the goal of serving all low-income children in high-quality care if we continue to dismantle our fragile early childhood system now in place or place new demands on it without new resources. Child care and families deserve a reauthorization that's infused with significant new funds that enable more children to have child care assistance and that ensure that these children are in high quality settings that can offer them strong early learning experiences. It's too important for parents and children not to make this, to make this a debate about whether access is more important than quality or vice versa. 
Real reform and accountability can't come without new investments to support the needed reforms. The reform should include a focus on making the child care assistance system more accessible and logical for parents, paying child care providers on time, offering more continuity of care for children so as parents lose their jobs, children aren't bounced in and out of child care settings. They should improve the standards for care that we fund, ensure that we have the support so the teachers can gain the education and skills they need to meet the standards, and make sure that our children are in safe settings. We also have to design these reforms not with one particular type of care in mind. We have to recognize the various types of care that families rely on. For example, many low-income moms work non-traditional hours and they work shift work. More formal child care arrangements are not likely to fit their schedules and they may have to rely on informal care. We need, to, we need reforms that work for all families, including these moms. What's different now than in 1990 is that mothers poured into the labor force in the 70s and 80s, leading to a significant increase in demand for child care. At the time, there wasn't much of a child care infrastructure to help these moms. Newspapers around the country between 1986 and 1990 had front page stories that just kept going on and on about families' challenges finding and affording child care. It was the subject of nightly news broadcasts. At one time, I was on um, NBC and, CBC and CBS on the same night. In 1998 or 1989, I believe, over 100 child care bills had been introduced. When we worked to draft the bill in the spring of 86 and then move it in 87 and 88 to ensure it was a subject of the campaign, it was. Both presidential campaigns candidates were in child care centers frequently and both had positions on child care. My mother was helping us out that summer because I think our youngest was then about 10 and she said, oh, being in this house is like being in poli sci 101. <laughs> this year it is challenging, it's, there's no doubt, to get many issues that affect families on the agenda. It's a different time, but it's not different for the children and families who need high quality and rich, reliable child care. And we have options. And with the will and some tough choices, we can find the resources to invest in child care, which by helping our families work and our young children learn supports a strong economy right now and in the fu future. We can do it. If we have to get moms to the picket lines, we will. But in community after community, if you go to meetings and you ask mothers what's on their mind, what are the most important issues, Low-income moms, middle-income moms, all moms, what do they say? We have the worst time finding child care. It's time we did something about it. It's, we've been having this debate for a long, long time, and it's time we, we do what's right by our, our kids. Thanks. Helen, thank you very much. It's really great, really great. Now we're going to turn to Rob, and Rob, I'll ask you to uh, focus on the very big picture uh, from your experience, if you would. Uh, just say you are one of the presidential candidates, uh, Robin. How would you make the case to the country that these issues are important? How would you persuade the country to make investments in, in early childhood or take seriously some of the issues that uh, I know you care deeply about and, and the folks in the room do as well? Well, David, thank you. <clears throat> the first thing I'd do, I'd get, uh, I'd get uh, Grace and I'd get Helen yeah. with me. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we'd go through the issues of safety, that it's, it's tough finding places to be assured that a child, young child can be safe. And that's really uh, the bottom line for that hour by hour, day by day process of taking care of children. You need Helen because you need to know that this, this struggle has been going on for many, many years. Uh, and I thank you, Helen, for that commentary. That was really uh, helpful uh, to, to hear how this debate has been, uh, has been waged in years past with victories, some losses, but it never, ever coming or going as far as it needed to go. For me, as a finance, business, economics professional, and as a student of history, this um, campaign is a lot like the 1960s, 1960 race between uh, Kennedy and Nixon. It's like the campaigns in the early 1900s when women's right to vote was a central 
civil rights issue of the country. It's like the campaigns of the 1840s and 1850s and ultimately the election of Abraham Lincoln when the issue of slavery or freedom was the central issue of the country. Similarly, those local elections before the revolution were similar in the way they cast the issue as being one in which there is a status of British citizenship and American citizenship, and there's a gap between the two, and the gap must be closed. The reason I bring this up, if I were a candidate, I would not be successfully elected because my platform would be to close the civil gap. All of us in this room, being somewhat uh, government professionals, we know that budgets are not really about money. They're about civil commitments. Budgets are architectures of all the civil commitments that we've made to each other as citizens over many generations. And the way in which these commitments, and ranging from everything from national security to air traffic control to uh, food safety, all of these commitments accumulated year after year very slowly and were reaffirmed and reshaped in appropriations and budget legislation. Families, people came to trust these commitments. They uh, shaped their lives, their businesses, their family plans around these commitments. Now we discover <clears throat> these, this budgetary architecture uh, is not sustainable. What we, is in this is another statement, which is this architecture of civil commitments is not sustainable. So when we say that there's a budget crisis, we're not saying that there's a lack of money. What we're saying is, is that the fabric of civil commitments that holds a society together is being torn apart. People no longer know how they relate to each other. People, business people no longer know whether contracts can be enforced. If spending is being cut back and courts are operating more slowly, can you get a contract enforced? The relationship of civil commitments is fragmenting Uncertainty is rising, trust is falling, investment is falling, economic growth is slowing, unemployment is rising. That's where we are. Now, in this, it's a civil crisis. It's a, it, it, there's something in it in which there's a, identifiably a group of individuals who are in essence budget advantaged and there's a category of people who are budget disadvantaged. Just as the British citizens were civilly advantaged relative to American citizens, and we had to fight a revolutionary war to close that gap, and just as there was a gap between free and slave in the 1850s, we had to fight a four-year bloody civil war to close that gap. And just as there was a gap between women and men in voting and it took 40 years, and ultimately a woman trying to star and starving herself in a jail not far from here to close that gap at the beginning of World War I. And just as there was a gap between majority and minority in access to education and public facilities in the, in the 1950s, that gap too was closed. But it took, in every single case, it took aggressive action and sometimes violent action to close those civil gaps. Now, who are, the, who are the budget advantaged in this story? What is the civil gap? The gap is between a group of people or families whose circumstances are paid for by deficits that are burdens on all other families and all future children. All future children. These deficits are so large and talked about in economic terms that what I'm hoping to convince you, as a, if I may say that I'm a candidate, I'm trying to convince you that it's not actually an economic problem at all, or certainly is an economic problem, but its deeper structure is that it is a civil rights problem. It is wrong, probably constitutionally wrong, to create a deficit structure which results in a tax necessities, which reach out and grab the labor of future children without their representation. That's a form of kind of fiscal slavery. You've reached out and grabbed their labor to spend it now. 
Who are the budget advantaged? Obviously, they are everyone who benefits from government services in one way or another and doesn't, so to speak, pay their fair share. It might be said that they are states that receive more than their fair share of government benefits. So, th so there's a sort of benefit uh, by geography. There is a uh, one by, so to speak, sector of the economy, if you're one of the budget benefiting, benefiting sectors of the economy. It might be uh, age, frequently referred to, and income, equally frequently referred to. But these categories of people whose li lifestyles, living standards are supported by these deficits, they represent the gap. And that's why it's so difficult for us to close it. It's also extremely difficult for us to talk about it. Now, <clears throat> if I were also a candidate, I would be talking about the solution to this civil problem being to invest in kids. And the, and the investment in kids is done for two reasons. One, it's very difficult to solve this civil problem without an economy that's doing better. One of the great disappointments to me, and it's really perhaps I can lay it on my own shoulders because I'm not sending items to the Huffington Post and elsewhere to explain that when the auto industry, which is 1.5% of GDP, which is big, when the auto industry ran into trouble, it got $80 billion in roughly you know, six months. When the financial industry, at 7.5% of GDP, even bigger, when it ran into trouble, it got $800 billion in about three months. How big is the sector that produces young adults? And can you imagine an economy without young adults? And if you were to spend in this economy, the sector, the youth human capital sector, the one that produces young adults, you know who produces your car. It's the auto sector. You know who produces or manages your checking account and so forth. That's the financial sector. You know who produces the food on your table. That's the agricultural sector. Well, the sector that produces young adults is the youth human capital sector. Autos is 1.5%. Finance is 7.5%. How big is the young adult human capital sector? 10.5%. 10.5%. It's without doubt the most important, and depending on how you look at it, it is the largest sector in the economy. And as we just heard from Grace and Helen, it's labor intensive. You spend money in that sector and you will create jobs. Now, if you can't imagine an economy without young adults, then you know you have to invest in them. Now, all of you know all of the Jim Heckman and other returns on investing in kids, so I'm not going to go back through that. What I'm going to say is that we as a community have failed, and I personally take this as a burden on myself. We as a community have failed to communicate to politicians that the youth human capital sector is as big as it is. And we as a, as a sector have not understood our situation as being one in which if you deprive a child early in its life of adequate nutrition, you are denying diminishing its ability to access its civil rights under the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. That's as grave a civil rights violation as any we've talked about in our 200 plus years as a country. We fail to do that. And we fail to talk about the budget as what it truly is, a civil crisis, not a budget crisis, a civil crisis. Now, how could we change that? How could we change it? One thing to do, we have to get much more uh, aggressive. We have to put in state capitals, in all 50 states, 5,000, 10,000, 25,000 people who are involved in raising kids on top, on the steps, and saying to members of state legislatures, you will vote for kids or you won't be in office. And if the next guy doesn't vote for kids, we'll kick him out too. And if you don't think it can be done, think about the basic numbers. Every congressional district has about 600,000 people in it. The number of people involved in, there are about 1,000 child service sites in every child district, everything from obstetricians' offices to high schools. There are about 50 
people associated with every one of those sites. That's 50,000 people. Those 50,000 people can turn every single race for the House of Representatives in this country, every single one of them. Now, the question is whether this community is prepared to get militant. It is it prepared to do what the founders of the country did in the 1770s? Are we prepared to do what was done in the 1860s? Are we prepared to do what women were doing in the early 1900s? Are we prepared to do what the civil rights activists were doing in the 1950s and 1960s? Great. Rob, just terrific. I, we've got a paper out there on the family-based social contract we did a couple years ago. We should just take this script and just uh, put it up, make it available. Of course, we are doing that here, and, and uh, I'm grateful for that very much. Lisa, let's build on that a little bit and turn to you if we could. Rob has is, is, is given a, a, a most eloquent case of, of changing how we think a little bit around our education and um, really our, our national priorities as they relate to, to financing um, towards our, our uh, human capital producers and towards the next generation. As we think about those earliest years, uh, maybe we can link the early years of education to the broader discussions on education reform going on uh, in our country and which actually are going on in the election. I mean, both candidates are talking at least about education, but more often as it relates uh, to either affordable college or more specifically K through 12. So they've not mentioned early learning and child care as much as we've liked as we've talked about, but perhaps let's put some of these issues in the context of some of the things they have talked about, which is, of course, dealing with education reform. Lisa, how does early learning fit into K through 12 reform and some of the other pieces of education, and how should it? Yeah, thanks, David. So, I mean, following the just uh, you know, amazing and really uh, deep um, comments that we've just heard, um, I, I'm, a lot of my remarks are in some ways very kind of practical and pragmatic. But I, I first just wanted to mention how important it is to be thinking about quality and access and investment and understanding this as part of this social contract that that Rob was describing and that David's written as well. And we have a paper out called The Next Social Contract for the Primary Years, which really re-envisions what education and learning opportunities can look like for, um, for young people and for their families. So I think that that's sort of, um, certainly in a, the, the place to start in, in talking about this. But as I was thinking about this question about how to connect um, what the presidential candidates should be saying about child care equals early learning, um, and what they aren't saying, I was going straight to the, to me, obvious connections they could be making um, in our education debates in this country, and how much we need to start connecting these issues to what we are already talking about in terms of schools and investing in and changing and improving our schools. So the first thing I wanted to just make very clear, and I don't think that any of us are in disagreement on this um, up here, but I, I unfortunately think that out there in the wider world and the public, this is not as recognized, and that is that child care programs are early learning programs, and that children from their very earliest ages, from, from infancy, are learning and developing social, cognitive, physical, motor skills, all of that is happening in the context of their environments in which they're, they're in, and that they are also, um, they should be in environments that are giving them a space to learn how to learn, and that that is like the, the, the primary thing that we as human beings need to be able to teach our young, right, to learn how to learn. So that we, we need to understand that these settings that young children are in, in, in their homes and in outside uh, child care centers and in family-based child care centers and in any other environments in which there's an adult caring for and interacting with a child, those are learning environments for these kids. And so we have, once we know that, we have to break out of the mindset that education starts at age six. And we, we have to break out of that and recognize the huge opportunity that's latent in these early learning settings for young, for young children to, to develop our next generation, really, right? To, to develop those strong students that we want in our schools and develop those, those adults that are innovating and in, in, in jobs that are, that are more than 
barely um, fair, fair wage work, right? So I think that both the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign are really missing an opportunity to, to make this connection um, to education reform conversations. So uh, the solid fix that we're all looking for in our, quote, K-12 system is not going to happen until we start thinking about what's happening for these children in their first six years of life. And, um, and until we can recognize as a country how far behind we are in investing in those children and in their families and really supporting their families. Um, so, and, and I really think we, we can't just stop at the kindergarten door by any stretch of the imagination. We've done a lot of work in the Early Education Initiative to focus on, well, what is kindergarten looking like? And, and how are we thinking about the new cognitive science, developmental science um, research as it relates to children's first grade year, second grade year, third grade, all the way up, actually, through children and young adulthood, the, the lives of, of young children and young adults. How are we understanding the, their capacity to learn? And are we actually harnessing that? So I wanted to give just a, a quickly three examples of where I've seen um, places where presidential and congressional candidates as well could be making a stronger case and aren't. Um, where when I hear the debates or read the newspaper, I go, geez, they missed it again. Like, how could they not be making these connections? Um, the first one for me is, so there's obviously a conversation in our country about improving conditions and job opportunities for the middle class, right? So when the candidates are talking about middle class families, they surely have in their mind a picture of a family with children, right? So who is taking care of those children when their parents are working? And are the child care professionals who are with them, are they able to provide those learning opportunities that were described so well by, by Grace and Helen and others in terms of really engage, allowing them to explore their worlds, connecting with them, really cherishing their curiosity and helping them build upon that? Are the, the professionals in these settings able to give that to kids? Have they got the training that they need to do that? Um, are they introducing them to art, music, movement, math, early math skills, certainly storytelling, um, uh, any other kind of opportunities that enable them to develop their language and their ability to express themselves, which is what we, we are seeing is not there for kids when they're getting into to <coughs> kindergarten classrooms. Our elected officials and those that want to be elected officials need to recognize that so many children in this country are not necessarily getting those opportunities. And the only way to fix some of our larger education problems in this country is to be looking at then what those kids are experiencing in those first first five and six years. So that's the first one, kind of the middle class Supporting um, middle class families and, and jobs for middle class families has to include this conversation. Secondly, in the education space, there's a lot of conversation around turnaround schools and teacher quality. That's a, the big part of the education debate in this country. And there's, those are two big issues that the Obama um, administration has focused on for failing school, for fixing failing schools. And certainly there's been a laser focus on, on effectiveness in teaching and how to improve our, our teacher workforce. And the Romney campaign has signaled an interest in improving our schools as well through a different a different avenue by promoting more choice and vouchers for, for parents. But neither side, I would argue, is recognizing that those reforms, if those are if ever put in place, will, will be far less successful if children are given this poor foundation in the first place. If kids are growing up in impoverished conditions and have little access to this kind of rich, curiosity-driven conversations that we're talking about that they need in those younger years, um, that those, those reforms aren't going to go anywhere. They aren't going to amount to anything until we start really getting serious about, about the problem that we're talking about here today. And, and schools are going to put up lots of resources and remediation and in teaching just those basic skills when, in fact, we really need our, our children to be uh, environments where there's a focus on innovative um, thinking, flexible thinking, um, much deeper background knowledge and multiple su subject matters and the way that they um, are integrated and, and in today's um, world. So wouldn't it be smarter, right? Wouldn't it be a far better use of our public funds and, and thinking of them as education dollars to be, um, and, and I, I want to say that, meaning not let's not just think about kind of the K-12 pool of dollars, but our investments as a, as a country that we've made as tax taxpayers, wouldn't it be smarter to be using those investments to be 
uh, kind of front loading to be making sure that we are setting these children up to succeed in the very first place. And then the third one I just want to mention is um, families, family values, strengthening family life. They, certainly this is an issue that comes up a lot on, on the campaign trail for candidates. And, um, and I don't doubt at all that um, that the candidates want to make sure that families are supported. But we need to have a really serious question then about how to do that for families who have young kids today. And um, th there was a, a, a comment made by, by Romney during an Education Nation segment on NBC this week, um, children may be best off as if a parent can stay at home with them. Um, and if, if that, if that and I think that that's maybe a conversation we need to have, but let's then get really serious about talking about family paid leave policies in this country, which a lot of work that David's done on that as well. And, and let's get really serious about um, what our early learning environments that children have can do to help parents, to be partners to parents, and be flexible so that parents don't feel like um, those things aren't uh, open or available to them, or that, oh, it's only going to be from 9 to 5 or even 9 to 12.30 this one day, and so those things aren't available to me. Let's like really think about how these early learning environments can work for, for today's working families. So those are, those are the three pieces I wanted to put out there on the table. And, and sure, I just think we're missing a big opportunity to connect early childhood education with the big issues that are affecting our country, with education and innovation issues. And um, so I'll be curious to see in the next couple of months if we can maybe stir the pot a little bit and, and get more of the conversation going on this. Very good. Lisa, thank you so much. As we turn towards our um, audience here, I, I may start by seeing if there's any immediate response or any questions among the panelists that you want to jump in on anything that you've heard from any of the other panelists, or maybe we should all go down and get militant uh, right now. <laughs> but, but we've got a little bit of time. We need to get militant with the folks in the audience first. So unless there's something that jumps out from one of the panelists or the other, we'll start with questions. Claire's going to go around with the mic here, and if you wouldn't mind, as you ask your question, you might identify your, your, yourself or your organization and ask a single question, uh, a brief one, so that we have uh, time uh, for folks to, to respond. So we'll start with the question here, and then we'll just start moving back through the room. So I just had a quick question. Um, I agree with everything that was said, and I do agree and wish that we had sort of settled um, on quality and investment uh, 20 years ago when we really had a good opportunity to do that. And I say that because I think one of the issues that the candidates are facing that I'd love to hear a response from is how do we now make investments in childcare when U.S. birth rates are at an all-time low in the last 25 years, when we have the elderly being uh, the largest segment, over 50 is our largest segment of U.S. population growth. So the question I have is, is it more that we have a a child care crisis or do we have a caregiver crisis? Because those same families that we're talking about who have young kids are also faced with now caring for their parents as they become of age. So I think we have a caregiving crisis and I'd love to hear a response to that. Well, you know what's, I'm sorry, do you know what? Yeah, we'll start, right. start with Helen and, and go from Grace here and we'll just we'll go, see how it goes. Then we may start doubling up questions. That's a very penetrating question though, a good one. So we'll start with Helen and See where it goes. What is interesting is once at the beginning of the child care bill, someone who was working for HHS at the time said, you better get this passed quickly because pretty soon everyone's going to be old and need yeah. caregivers, and that's all they're going to focus on. Well, first, it may be that the birth rate's declining, but one in four children under six is poor. And so we've got this growing number of young children who are poor, and we know their mothers have to work because we know poverty, um, especially in young children, is extremely damaging. Um, and we know they need high quality early learning opportunities. Another interesting issue, which is something I think I would tell President Romney, but I can't blog about it because it's related to electioneering, is that we have a huge number of children growing up in single parent families, and especially for you know, African American families, I think it's what, close to 70%, if not over, and those single moms have no choice but to go, go to work. And I, I think paid leave is really a, a critical component of any early childhood strategy, but at the most we would ever have is three months in, in this country probably. And so we need high quality early, ch early childhood opportunities. Um, and we also need to support caregivers of young children. Um, 
And what's also ironic is that women, and I think you and I talked about this a long time ago, are go most many low-income women are those caregivers at either end of the spectrum, and they're going to need the kind of child care arrangements that make sense. They may need child care assistance at night and on the weekends, and then they may need a high-quality pre-K program um, in, in the mornings. We're going to have to have, you know, more flexible, complex um, solutions. But... I still think it's it's a major, major need. Um, and I think with middle class families facing more economic strains, the cost of college, the cost of housing, they need assistance because they're buying the kind of child care that if they're honest, they're not really very happy about. Grace? Uh, I, I think you hit it right on the head. Uh, we have a caregiver crisis. And it's not just for the elderly in this nation, it is also for children. But unlike the situation with children, we have spent some resources on the elderly. I mean, there is Social Security, and we all, every single one of us in this room, contributes to Social Security. And there's uh, uh, elderly um, people have a minimum, some minimum protection. And when they're in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, there are some minimum protections there's background checks for people who work with the elderly. Make sure that they're treated okay. Um, you know, I wouldn't call that an early, you know, a later learning area, although mm. I think some of them do have later learning uh, opportunities in those facilities. But at least there's recognition that the elderly need to be treated in a safe and decent manner. And with children, there's no minimums, absolutely none. The Child Care and Development Block Grant doesn't have any minimums. And you can see the states are all over the map. And you can see uh, children are really left to their own devices and parents are really left on their own. And I would say that uh, when you go to the grocery store, you have a choice. You have a choice um, when you pick out vegetables. And you have a choice when you pick out meat. And you know as a parent, when you get the cart and you're walking around and you can put things in the cart, that somebody out there who knows something about the quality of meat and the quality of fresh vegetables and things that you want to buy because you might eat them and you don't want to get sick, somebody has set a bar somewhere and you've made sure there's some minimum, it may not be fancy, but some minimum that's not going to harm you in some way. But we don't have that for child care. Parents are really out there on their own and they're expected to be kind of their own um, uh, eyes and, uh, and experts in a field that's really complicated. It's, you know, I think um, the time has really come if we really care about, you know, school achievement and closing the achievement gap and making progress when children are in school and um, <coughs> increasing the high school graduation rate, all with an eye to long-term economic growth of this country, that we need to be looking at those early learning set settings. And we need to make sure in this caregiver crisis that we have a big enough civil commitment that we are there paying as much attention to the youngest in this country as we do to the oldest. I know some might say we're not paying enough attention to the elderly, uh, and that may be the case, but I certainly think it's a great deal more than we spend uh, on the youngest. In 1996, I was pregnant with my uh, second child, and he's 16 now. I mean, that's like three generations of young children, zero to five, have gone through this cycle of early learning. And where are we? I couldn't agree more with what Helen said. We, uh, in some ways, have made a little bit of progress. But as far as the uh, roadmap to quality, uh, we're not there. And how many more generations is going to take before we make sure that you know, children are in a safe setting and that we recognize this link between the setting that they start off in for five years, for 35 hours a week for the most part, it leads to the ultimate consequence of where they are and how they succeed when they get to school. Um, so I would just say I agree, and we've got to do something about it. All right. Rob, you have well, a comment? <clears throat> uh, what was said is, is uh, illuminates the question completely. The one of the gaps that has to be closed is the generational gap into civil terms. I had a real 
pleasure of being on the board of directors of an organization that ought to be at this table. It's Generations United. I just went off the board last year, and uh, <clears throat> typical of things that I do, right about the time I go off the board, the organization gets recognized as one of the 50 best nonprofits in the country by one of the, you know, looking for innovative groups. The Generations United has done a lot of work on this issue of older and younger. And what they find is that sh shared sites end up improving the health of seniors and increasing the education performance of, of little kids. Um, I'm 68, or I will be in 45 days. Do I look like I could take care of a kid? I'm the oldest by anybody's definition of the baby boom generation. The youngest is about 54. The very old that you're talking about is a relatively small portion of the population. The old that you want to be focusing on is between me and age 54, basically um, the age of many sort of active business and uh, political and uh, leaders of uh, lots, of, lots of kinds. And and, and what we want to do is to get these people to recognize that they have this obligation because, as was pointed out, the birth rate's falling, so to speak. If GDP is a function of capital, labor, technology, land, so forth and so on, in that capital component, it is GDP is dependent on the production of young adults educated, team-oriented, globally competitive, tuned in, fun to be around young adults, 18-year-olds. If you don't have them, you're not going to be competitive. GDP is not going to grow. You're not going to solve any of these problems. And you're going to just go to drift, kind of like Greece or Japan. That's the, your future. But what's thrilling to me is the uh, challenge of becoming militant over the requirement that the baby boom soon to be geezers have a responsibility. Even in their own self-interest, they should be doing what the Constitution says. Now some of you may have noticed I kind of glanced at my cell phone a little bit earlier. I wanted to go back and make sure I had the wording right. The Constitution says we ordain and establish this Constitution to preserve the blessings of liberty. They could have put a period there, but they didn't. They went on to say, we preserve the blessings of liberty for ourselves. They could have stopped there, but they didn't. We preserve the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. That's what the Constitution says. The Constitution of the United States contemplates multiple generations as having civil rights. A society which is systematically depriving its youngest of nutrition, health care, strong parenting or caring, housing, and the other things that are necessary to be successful in life, which things we know are most importantly provided conception to kindergarten. It's that's when the 85% of the brain is formed, as has been pointed out. To deny it at that age means you, as Lisa says, forget about K through 12 reform. You're going to have what you've got now, which is steadily falling high school SAT scores. Because you systematically began to underinvest in kids 15, 20 years ago. So, if the blessings of liberty, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and all that the pursuit of happiness means, which it means to be able to engage in business, practice your faith, raise a family, these things require education, particularly in a modern era. To deny a child at the earliest point in his life so that they'll never get back on track is profoundly, profoundly, aggressively, almost genocidically, a civil rights violation. It is, I, I, as, a, as a student of history, 
someone who's traveled all over the world, I see no way for this community to achieve what it seeks to achieve in behalf of children, except by becoming much more militant. Powerful. All right, let's see. Let's start taking questions in groups. Of, well, let's see how many more questions. We've got one question here. Let's see if the other hand sort of go. All right, we'll take Eric's. We'll take the two questions here as a block, and we'll just sort of see what kind of responses we get from our panel. All right. Oh, I have so much to say. I will, I'll really avoid doing that and will pose a question. I would like to highlight, though, that I came wearing a different hat, and now I'll speak on behalf of the National Association for Regulatory Administration, which oversees licensing in the 50 states for child care, adult care, and child welfare. Um, just came from California, and to kind of put some context around Grace's remarks, the Department of community care licensing in the state of California oversees all of those residential child care and adult care settings and are responsible for inspecting more than 100,000 facilities in their state. So they do get round every five years, but they do respond to complaints much more regularly. So just to throw that in the mix, excuse me. Um, the candidates, and I'm really happy, Lisi, that you mentioned um, Education Nation this week. I think if New America and others could just put the comments made by the candidates in that environment side by side, we would see a stark contrast in their civil commitments. And I think that would be a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, and then finally, some of the candidates that you haven't talked about, and I didn't expect today would be so much about licensing, um, but we have a whole set of candidates out there running for office right now in state legislatures. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is within state legislatures that um, regulations are enacted and approved. So I just would like the comments connect, you know, the um, panelists' connections from the presidential candidates on down the line to where uh, kind of state-based rights and regulation are connected. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good point. We framed it in terms of the federal piece, knowing that there's a lot of other things going on at the state level that's very, very good. Let's hear Eric's question. That's a powerful question. We'll, we'll let everyone respond to it. But let's get, get Eric's, and then we'll go down the line, starting with Lisa, and just see if any of the two questions re, uh, raise something up for you that you'd like to respond to. Thank you. Um, I, I'm Eric Krolak with the Early Care and Education Consortium, which is an alliance of uh, about 9,000 child care centers around the country. You know, uh, you, you've spoken so strongly to the need for improvement, for reform. And uh, one of the things I'm struck by is the why in this question. Why aren't the campaigns picking this up and talking about uh, investing in kids and making a priority of uh, the crisis in caregiving that we have in the country. Um, Grace, your organization puts out some excellent reports, and you mentioned the one that referenced that parents are really tapped right now. And there, there is an ac additional capacity there for, for the resources that would be necessary to meet reforms. And in you mentioned, uh, Lisa, about the K-12 world, and we all know how in our communities that's a world where resources are also constrained. Is there something in the why of why campaigns aren't picking this up that is related to the the resource issue and the need for prioritization or, or reprioritization and shifting of priorities that explains why this isn't the issue it was in 1988 or 1990 or even in, in the background in 1996 with welfare reform? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. I right, may begin with Lisa and just okay. see out of those two questions here, and we'll go down. I have a thought on the last one, too, so we'll just keep going on down the line. Yeah, I actually think my, my answer is in a way similar for both um, because I think that a big part of the why has to do with the money question and um, where the resources are going to come from to make this possible, to really invest in our young kids and our families with young kids. And there's been, um, I think, a real chill right now over being able to have any conversations about innovations or new initiatives, even consolidating programs in a way that would lead to better outcomes but still would require you know, some real federal and state investment. Those kinds of conversations are dampened by the 
larger cloud that's hanging over everything right now when it comes to you know trying to figure out if there's going to be any more <coughs> government revenue to use to, to do mm -hmm. this with mm -hmm. um, and so uh, <laughs> so part of part of uh, you know, what a lot of us, I think, are doing is, is thinking, okay, everyone's just kind of stalling out on this because of the debt question and because of the election, and then November 7th, you know, we'll like ramp back up, and maybe, but my worry is that if we're not having these conversations now, um, that we won't be prepared um, for when maybe some of those roadblocks are removed in, in, in the near future. And, and I'm really struck um, by what Helen said earlier, which is that in the past there had been conversations about trouble with the deficit, and yet there was, there was the ability to think about investing in, in young children. Um, and I, I'm now, I'm really kind of grappling with that. Like we are at a place where we, we as a society can't even really seem to think about it in a, in a, in a broader way because we um, are just seeing a shrinking pie and that's all we're seeing is a shrinking pie. So I, that's a, a, just a big problem to put out, out there. I think at the state level, there are, um, we're now in a situation where because of the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grants that have come from the Obama administration and because of some states that just on their own have some really innovative and dynamic leaders who are trying to put this, these issues to the forefront, we have some states that are moving um, fairly quickly in a constrained environment mm -hmm. to be focusing on quality and to be thinking about more children um, getting uh, more disadvantaged children having having access uh, or at least setting up a stage so that more of those those children will have access when when if things can open up a little bit again but there's now we have a, almost a have a half not situation depending on what state a child's been born in right or what uh, what kind of community um, it's back down to that zip code issue that that the pre-k-12 world talks about so much you know um, educational opportunities dependent on zip code well we really are in the same place when it comes to, to young children and opportunities for their families and opportunities for their um, early learning um, environments so um, there's lots more to say on the on the on the state front, and 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 I would actually encourage folks to look at a a previous event that that David and I held that looked at state innovations, and it's it's online and archived. Um, the video of that is archived. But I will I will cede time over to some other folks here to to raise those issues. Okay, we'll just we'll go to Grace, and then. Wow, those were some great questions, uh, and I think everyone in the room should think about how we can change this. Uh, number one, Eric, to your point, why aren't they talking about it? Because they don't have to. Because they can get away with not addressing it. Because nobody's calling for it. Because we're not standing up en masse and saying, fix child care. Do something about it. We're tired of this. We see a connection. To your point, uh, do something and we'll find some people who do. You know what? Until we en masse can stand up in a articulate way and make that point, whether it's a you know, working mom, not show up at a rally. You can't do it at one rally. It is every day. Unless there's a civil commitment for every day to stand up en masse uh, and raise visibility on this issue, then they're going to get away with it because they can. Second, uh, I think this is to your point. <laughs> Why isn't anything being done? Because this Congress is the most polarized Congress in years, and I think there has to be a message from voters. We sent you there to uh, review policy, make sure uh, what's happening is effective, that we're headed in the right direction, to reach common ground when necessary, and that compromise isn't a dirty word. And as long as the Congress is allowed to be polarized, sticking out political positions rather than good public policy decisions to promote families and assist children and make connections the way the rest of us do, uh, then you get what you get. And I'm hoping the next Congress is going to be looking to find common ground and do right by families with children and that the American public says enough with polarization. We're sick of it. Keep the public, you know, keep the uh, political press release and give it to somebody who wants that, but not us. We're done with it. That compromise is not a dirty word, and finding common ground is incremental change, and that's how policy happens, and that's uh, what we hope to see. Uh, and what are we doing about it? 
uh, I heard the question on, you know, inspections. And uh, I think that we, in our reports, I hope it comes across this way, uh, believe inspections really make a difference. And they are key and really important. And we're looking to find the most effective way possible to ensure that um, there can be inspections on a frequent basis, a regular basis, to ensure that uh, children are in the best setting that they can be. And building on that, uh, we are working to get a nationwide network of parents who will stand up and make these points. I uh, agree with Helen that we should be ashamed that only one out of every six children in this country receives assistance because all the studies show that uh, low-income children have the most to gain from access to high-quality care. But what I also know is this is not a low-income family's issue. This is an issue. Child care is an issue for all families. All families with a working mom, and right now there's uh, about two-thirds of moms with children under six, under five, are in the workforce today. This is an issue for all of them. When I go home and I talk to my neighbors, everybody talks about hard to find care. Once you find it, hard to afford it. Once you get it, then you get questionable quality and what's good enough? What can I live with? We are working with parents throughout the country to change that. Stop talking. It's great to talk to each other, but you've got to stand up and talk to policymakers, absolutely at the state level, in every state capital, and not just at rally day, but every day. And also reach out to Congress. So we're working on it. We uh, have about 13,000 parents in our Child Care Aware Parent Network. We have parent leaders, about 80 that we've been working with to bring to D.C. and have uh, uh, some training because it's intimidating. Parents think, oh, geez, laws, well, those are for the experts. And we turn around and say, you, you parents as consumers of child care, you are the experts. But you need a little confidence builder to accept that because you don't think so. You think, well, the members of Congress and the staff, they're the experts, and they are, but they know it from a different lens. Frankly, they know it mostly from hearing about it from those who use it. And parents need to come together and understand that they have power in coming together and increasing visibility. And without the visibility, Eric, we're going to get back right to the beginning. All these, pol all these policymakers and these candidates, whether they're running for state office or they're running for federal office, even at the highest level for president, they don't have to say a thing if they can get away with it. It's only if you can create the buzz to make them address the issue. The $800 billion that you mentioned for the bankers, you better believe the bankers didn't just talk to each other and say, yikes, I hope somebody does something. The bankers came to D.C., the bankers went to the state level, the bankers were loud and clear, do something. And parents have to do the same. Before Rob, before Rob, before you answer that, on that, just, I want to see just because we're going to we're going to get to a place where by the time we get to the last two questions, we may be right up at our two o'clock time. We'll take one more question to add to this mix here and to see if it sparks anything else for Helen and Rob as they continue the the piece. We'll take the one question here from uh, the lady on the on the right to add to the mix. Good afternoon. My name is Magoy Tigoner. I'm with Title One Report and Education Daily. Thank you for having this. Um, I wanted to ask all of you. How in your organizations are you going to try to get some questions about um, early child care and learning into those presidential debates? How are we going to get the candidates talking? And then um, as far as the reauthorization of ESC, how do we get the infant and toddler and early learning in there? Okay, very good. All right. I saw Helen smile, so maybe when Helen, Rob, we'll, we'll turn to Rob. I cut Rod off Rob there, so he's ready to go, I know. But, but Helen, <laughs> Helen, at the very least, will, will answer that question, I know. I Thanks actually have an answer Wait. for you. Yeah, but we got it. Rob's up. <laughs> oh, I'm Rob's sorry. up. Go Rob's ahead. up, and then you're going to have the last, Helen will have the last word here. Oh. Seating the time to Helen. Word? Helen's going to have, Rob will have the last word. Somebody talk. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go ahead and let Helen have the last word. It's kind of the reverse of ladies first. Um, the reason the bankers got what they uh, got <clears throat> was because they were organized <clears throat> and they were literally quite prepared to show up in the thousands, and they did in Washington, D.C., where it mattered. <clears throat> what has to happen is on weekends, when parents can do it, they have to show up in numbers that people can visibly see. 5,000, 10,000, 25,000 at a state capitol on a sunny weekend. That is what is visible. 
and that marks a change in this in the um, civic state of the youth human capital sector. It has changed from being a recipient and passive and accommodative to being assertive, aggressive, and insistent that the country do what it should do, which makes sense economically and civilly. Uh, the reason it hasn't been done, Eric, I believe is first the question of money is, is very clear. Second is that the money question hasn't been expressed yet as a civil question. And third, it is not quite recognized yet how vitally dependent the country is on a trained, educated, team-oriented, likable, fun, youth human capital population, young adult population. We haven't quite recognized the, in a sense, the deficit we have there. Um, as for the state level, I think a lot is happening. Uh, at Ready Nation, we uh, work at the state level. We attempt to put together business coalitions, business leader groups that recognize the importance of educating kids from conception to, you know, properly taking care of them, educating, caring for them, conception to kindergarten. We're finding more and more business people who get the reality. They are understanding what the situation is as they're increasingly ready to take action. And additionally, um, in this area that Lisa pointed to, educating early actually uh, solves elementary school problems, we find that um, we published a report last March, it's on the website, on social impact finance, Pixie bonds for pray for pre-K to reduce special education costs. Well, what we know is that quality three-year-old pre-kindergarten provided to 100 kids yields a reduction in special education costs alone, mm -hmm. enough to pay for all the, the services. So what is, um, there is a, at the state level, this understanding can take place and people can act on it. It can even be better done on a school district level. So in many respects, the, the power of technology and communication and so forth is enabling people at local levels to act in ways they cannot act at the federal level. And as they act at the local and region, county, and state level, it becomes then uh, uh, clear at the federal level what needs to be done. So for my standpoint, uh, the beginnings of this process uh, are sufficiently still new that it would be a sort of a third reason why we shouldn't we would be surprised we we should not be surprised by why this relatively inact in inaction at the at the federal level but at the state level a lot is going on what uh, lisa and david are doing uh is is uh, informing this and energizing it uh, it's making it easier for those of us who are attempting to organize business leaders in those states and to increase the use of social impact, pay for success finance. So um, I'm very encouraged by what's happening at the local and state level. Thank you. Ron. And Helen, the last word. Sure. Let me first give the most simple um, answer um, to your question and something everyone can do when they leave this room. Go to our website, www.nwlc.org, and there are two things you can do. There's one box that shows you how to tweet and, tw and Twitter the hosts of all the debates and ask them to ask a question about reducing mm -hmm. poverty and, and um, addressing early childhood and child care. You can do that. All your friends can do that. And maybe if we get enough people to do it, they'll actually ask a question. There's also, there's also a map that says put child care on the map, encouraging you to ask everyone you know to get state elected officials, federal elected officials into child care centers, and then they too can put a pin on that map. I agree that we have to be more militant. We actually used to use more of those techniques, both in the 90 and 96 reauthorization, and we have to be more demanding. I also believe that this is a campaign and a Congress that isn't doing or saying very much about anything. Um, so that is definitely, definitely a challenge to get anything constructive said. Um, we have to push more. But I guess my, um, and I would disagree about some, I think that there is some interesting activity going on in the states, but I think there is a lot of shallow activity going 
on in the states and a lot of some very serious situations in terms of what's going on with state funding for childcare and early education and in, in some places where it may look good system wise in terms of planning it's very precarious on what we're going to be able to maintain in terms of a strong early childhood system but my final um remark since i was allowed to be the last have the last word <laughs> is to the business leaders and i would all urge all the business leaders who have increasingly stepped out to support early childhood to also step out to the tax writing committees and point out all the tax loopholes that we can close and all the tax increases that are absolutely viable that will provide the revenues that we need to provide the early childhood system that our children and our families deserve. I think that's doable. Friends, what a great panel. Please join me in saying thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you to the, we have our marching orders now. Uh, thank you to the Casey Foundation and the C-SPAN, and thank you for joining us today. We are adjourned. Have a good afternoon.